Inshallah today we will conclude with uh, biography of we just mentioned a few biographies a few of the wives of the Prophet next week we will go to a new topic but relevant and consistent with our overall topic inshallah next week we will begin to cover Hadith Qudsi uh, Hadith Qudsi which talk about uh, and remind us about akhlaq and our relations and uh, with each other and how that connects to our uh, connections to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there was a woman uh, who had accepted Islam early on in Mecca and her name was Hind and uh, she had a husband named Abdullah and they both were amongst the first believers in Mecca and uh, they were given permission by Prophet ﷺ to make hijrah from Mecca to Habashi, Abyssinia and they did that and uh, while there they had stayed for a while um, they had heard uh, after being there a year or so they got false information uh, that Mecca had been conquered, the Mushriks had been run out uh, the Quraysh uh, had some of them had become Muslim uh, this was false information of course but it had, this news had reached uh, Abyssinia uh, and so uh, upon hearing this news, they decided to journey back to Mecca. Um, and at that time, Hind had given birth uh, to a young boy. Uh, his name was Salama, and Hind took on the name Um Salama. And uh, so they journeyed back to Mecca. When they reached Mecca, they found that the condition of the Muslims was actually worse when they had left. Um, they were persecuted even more. Uh, they were there was a major. Um, oppression going on etc and they resolved to, uh, to, to stay with the Prophet Sallallahu as long as they could but then after the second uh, Aqabah, the second uh, meeting the Prophet Sallallahu had he arranged to, for the Hijra to Medina uh, and then uh, Hind or Umm Salama and her husband Abdullah who by the way was the her husband Abdullah Abu Salama was the brother of the Prophet Sallallahu by rada'a, by nursing, by suckling. So they had the same nurse mother. Uh, uh, and so this was actually the brother of the Prophet ﷺ. Um, and Umm uh, Salama, uh, her uh, cousin, one of her relatives, was uh, a man by the name of Khalid, uh, who, whose father was name was Walid. Uh, and we know Walid was the famous Walid ibn Mughira that's mentioned in the Quran. Uh, in Surah Mudathir uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala got angry with him because he accused the Quran of being the word of uh, in هذا illa qawlul bashar this is the word of bashar and so Khalid ibn Walid was a, a, a relative of Umm Salama uh, the, Umm Salama and her husband Abdullah get the permission to migrate from the Prophet ﷺ. they gather their things they have their young son uh, Salama with them and uh, in the morning they they're, they're on their camel and they're proceeding to the outskirts of Mecca when all of a sudden they are um, um, ambushed uh, by a few of the tribes and, and some of the relatives of Umm Salama and the swords are drawn uh, and there's a threat to the life of Umm Salama a threat to the life of the baby, a threat to the life of Abdullah and one of the uh, attackers says uh, Abu Salama you are not proceeding to Medina you have the right, uh, we will allow you to proceed by yourself, but your wife and your son must remain here in Mecca. And in the end there was, there was no choice, uh, Abu Salama was forced uh, to go ahead and continue to Medina alone. Umm Salama was actually taken prisoner uh, and her son was taken prisoner, they were separated. Um, the family and the tribe of Umm Salama uh, actually kept her under what we would call house arrest. Uh, and she was stayed, she was put in the house of one of her relatives and not allowed to leave. And her son, Salama, was actually put in, the, in a different house 
and raised in the house of someone else. Um, and so this separation between her and her son, uh, and of course the family and, and being away from the husband, the husband did make it, Abu Salama did make it to Medina. This separation uh, occurred for one year. Well, one year they were apart. Finally, one of the relatives of Umm Salama had uh, compassion and said, you know, enough is enough. Essentially, she goes to uh, the captives and petitions for the release of Umm Salama after a year. Um, he, the family decides to release Umm Salama. She goes and she uh, petitions for her son back. Her son is a year older. They release her son. And on the moment they release her son, uh, she gathers uh, his things and she takes the first uh, ride out to Medina and she's riding alone. Um, she was given a small mount. She left immediately to go join her husband. And she reaches the uh, outer skirts of Mecca and she comes across uh, a tribe uh, that was familiar, that was known to her husband. And there was a Sahaba that was there whose name was Osman ibn Talha. And Osman ibn Talha recognizes her and he says, Oh, Umm Salama, where are you going alone? And she says, I'm going to Medina to re be reunited with my, my husband, uh, uh, Abu Salama. And he says, is there no one else that is traveling with you? And she says, by Allah, it is only myself and my son. And Osman ibn Talha says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not leave you alone. And uh, Osman drops his belongings, immediately takes the reins of her mount, and he walks her all the way from the outskirts of Mecca to Medina. She narrates uh, that uh, Osama bin Zaid actually narrates on her behalf that uh, Umm Salama said that of all the people from this tribe, Osman ibn Talha was the most generous uh, of them. She said at times when it was time to take a break, he would actually take the mount, uh, a lot, drop it down or lower it down, and then she said he would walk away and give her complete and total privacy. After a while, he would come back, uh, grab the, uh, the mount, uh, rest, allow it to rest so that she could mount uh, the animal. As she's trying to mount the animal, he would then walk away again to give her privacy, uh, and then he would come back and take the animal. Every time they needed to rest, he would make sure the animal was tied, and then he go, would go out in seclusion to leave her uh, in a state of privacy where she could feel comfort. He accompanies her all the way to Medina, drops her off, and then walks all the way back to Mecca, subhanAllah. Look at the, 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 the akhlaq of Osama ibn Talha. Usman ibn Talha. So she's reunited with her husband, um, and uh, there's a period of happiness, and then uh, during Uhud, uh, he's, uh, her husband, Abu Salama, he's participating in the battle of Uhud and he's participating with his brother and his family members. And an archer, uh, he's wounded in his arm or in his shoulder by an arrow from an archer. Uh, he comes back after Uhud, he's treated. Uh, he lost a lot of blood uh, because of that incident. And he's resting um, and his wound closes up a little bit. The Prophet ﷺ visits him, asks how he's doing, etc. And he seems to be uh, getting better and healing. Word reaches Medina that a, 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 a tribe is planning to attack Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ wants to go and meet this tribe before they actually get to the, the gates of Medina. And so the Prophet ﷺ assembles uh, a group of men from Medina, a group of Muslims, 150 of them. And he asked about the health of Abu, Abu, Abu Salama. And Abu Salama acknowledges he's healthy, he's ready. So the Prophet ﷺ appoints Abu Salama uh, as captain. Of, of, this, of this force. They go out, they meet the enemy, they become victorious. But in the heat of the battle, Abu Salama is moving his arm too much and his wound opens up again. Uh, he loses a lot of blood as a result of that. Uh, he starts hemorrhaging and he uh, passes out. By the time he reaches Medina, uh, he's, he's, he's near death. Um, he ends up uh, passing away. Before he passes away, the Prophet ﷺ visits him and just is in tears. Uh, uh, over his situation, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, it may be assumed, Wallahu alam, uh, felt some, some, some sadness that he sent him back out uh, into battle and he's not really, really ready. When he passes away, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, made an incredible dua. And his dua was he asked for the forgiveness of Abu Salama and he said, Ya Rabb, ajalhu make him min al-muqarrabeen. 
from the Muqarrabeen. Imagine the Prophet ﷺ making this dua for you. Making it from amongst the Muqarrabeen. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he asked forgiveness for himself. He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive himself. After that, he praised the janazah, namaz, the janazah salat. When he praised the janazah salat, he, uh, over Abu Salama, he does not four takbirs, but nine takbirs in the janazah salat. There's nine. At the end of the salat, after he's buried, the salat is asking, Ya Rasulullah, uh, why did you do nine takbir? And the Prophet ﷺ responded, he said, Wallahi, it was not out of sahu, it was not out of forgetfulness that I did nine. But he said, had I done 1,000 takbir, Abu Salama would have been deserving of that. Right, subhanAllah. And so, uh, he, uh, Abu Salama is buried, the Prophet ﷺ grieves Umm Salama, may Allah be pleased with her, uh, starts her grieving and she narrates and she reports, uh, as can be found in her biography, she says, she cried for days. She was broken for days. They had actually made a pact before he went to Uhud, before her husband went to Uhud. Uh, they made an agreement, or she tried to uh, have him make an agreement that if something were to happen to one of them, if one of them were to pass away, that the other would not remarry so that they could both be husband and wife in Jannah. And she actually said, I will never remarry. Uh, if, I die, if, if you die first, I will never remarry. And Abu Salama told her, he said, I do not want that for you. He said, if I die first, he said, marry again. And then he, made, he raised his hands and he made dua that, Ya Rabb, if I die first, give Umm Salama a husband that will not cause her sadness and will not cause her to be distressed. Uh, so he ends up dying. And so she waits a, a year. She's in mourning for a year. As was the tradition among some uh, of the of the Arabs, uh, they would go to offer to take care of the widow, and so she at this time has not only had her son Salama, but she's also had three other uh, children as well. Um, and so she's a mother of four children. So she's approached first and foremost by Abu Bakr al Siddiq, who offers to marry her and to take care of her children, and she gently. Uh, uh, um, you know, rejects the proposal. Then after that, Umar radiallahu ta'ala goes and offers to marry and take care of her uh, and the children. And she also gently uh, uh, turns down that uh, proposal as well. And then after that, later on, the Prophet sallallahu goes and offers to do the same thing. And she says to the Prophet, she says, Ya Rasulullah, she said, I am a jealous woman. And she said, not only am I jealous, she said, but I am an older woman. And she said, not only am I older, or an older woman, she said, um, I have children, and not only that, I don't have a willy. So she mentions four excuses uh, to, uh, that she, in her mind, would be an obstacle for her eligibility uh, to marriage to the Prophet ﷺ. One, that she's a jealous woman. Two, that she uh, has children. Uh, uh, three, that she's an older woman. And four, that uh, she uh, does not have a wudi. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, as for your jealousy, I will make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove it from you. And inshallah, I hope that he will remove it from you. He says, as for your being older, now she was, says she was older at this time, she was 30, 29 or 30 years old. But at that time, that was considered, uh, she, you know, culturally, that was, uh, she was older. She says, uh, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as for your being older, he said, I am older than you. He says, as for your children, uh, leave them to Allah and His Messenger, SubhanAllah. And he said, as for your not having a wali, he said, I do not believe there is anyone who would object to the nikah, to the marriage. Uh, she accepts, uh, they are married, uh, a mahar is paid, they have a walima. Uh, her family... All of her family attend the wedding, and it is actually at that wedding, or perhaps a little bit after that, Khalid ibn Walid becomes inspired uh, and becomes Muslim, and much of her family enters into Islam uh, at that time. Um, when she becomes one of our mothers, uh, she actually she was already a very educated woman. She had a lot of skills. Uh, she uh, was literate, and she used to write poetry as well. She's very high. 
edu- class woman, very educated, mashallah. And she's very astute when it came to uh, what we would call strategy. Uh, so she used to accompany the Prophet وسلم, on so many of his military expeditions. Right. And on several occasions, uh, she would advise the Prophet وسلم, uh, on certain matters relating to the community. She's very active in that regard. She's also very outspoken uh, as well. On several occasions, she would actually correct Umar ibn al-Khattab on, on certain matters. She would actually speak out and correct him in his judgment on certain matters. Uh, she was the only wife of the Prophet وسلم, that had ever seen Jibreel السلام, but she did not see him of course in his, full, in, in his angelic uh, form uh, Jibreel السلام, had come to the house uh, but he had come in the form of another Sahaba another a, a man um, and he uh, was speaking or he was in the presence of the Prophet وسلم, Um Salama had saw him and uh, he had seen Um Salama. And at that point, he got up and he left. And Um Salama had just thought it was uh, a particular Sahaba. And the Prophet وسلم, said, Did you know who that was? And she said, uh, That was this particular Sahaba, whose name was uh, Dihna or Dihra. Uh, and he says, No, it was Jibreel. It was the angel Jibreel, mashallah. And the Wahi, the Quran, then started to come down in the home of. Um Salama at that time. This would be a small uh, uh, source of, of, of gentle raqabat, gentle rivalry between she and Aisha because before that time, the wahi used to always come down in the home of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. But after the marriage to Um Salama, Jibreel alayhi started to come to the home of the Prophet started to come to the home of Um Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha. She actually, Um Salama's home was actually the home of the Prophet's uh, wife Zainab, who had passed away six or seven months after, after they had gotten married. Um, so she started her 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 journeys with the Prophet وسلم, and she took a lot of ilm from the Prophet وسلم. After Aisha, she narrated the most uh, hadith from amongst the wives of the Prophet uh, وسلم. She narrated approximately 378 hadith. Uh, a little over a dozen, a dozen of them are actually recorded in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. She, in the time of the Prophet وسلم, before the Prophet وسلم, died, she became what we would call a faqiha. She used to, after the death of the Prophet وسلم, the Sahabas would consult her, she would give fatawa. Uh, she was very known for her fatawa, her legal judgments, her legal opinions in matters of the, of the sharia. Um, she is most famously known for her advice of the Prophet uh, at the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, as we all know, um, where she advised the Prophet وسلم, on what to do regarding the, the, the fact that the Sahabas had come all the way to Mecca and they had to be turned away. Uh, and the Prophet وسلم, had agreed to the matters in the treaty. Uh, and after he agreed to them, the Sahabas were very disappointed. He وسلم, asked them uh, to shave their heads and to do slaughter, to slaughter the animal, to, to do nahar. Uh, and so they had refused. And he asked Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a second time, uh, and they refused. They refused not because they did not, they were against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but because they were so disappointed. The human side of them uh, emerged. Um, and they were so disappointed. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left and went to those quarters and confided in Umm Salama about this dilemma. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, she said, uh, they had hopes, her nasiha. Ya Rasulullah, they had hopes uh, to, to be in the presence of the Kaaba. And they came all the way here and their hopes are broken. Have mercy on them. She said, you go out, you shave your head and you slaughter and they will follow you. And then the Prophet ﷺ did as she recommended. Got up and uh, slaughtered and shaved his head. And then the Sahabas followed suit. So her advice in times of trauma, in times of turmoil, in difficult times, she was a person who was balanced in her judgment and was a wise woman and preferred sulh, uh, the, bringing people together in the idea, in the spirit of mutual love and brotherhood and solidarity uh, rather than uh, uh, keeping conflicts and giving advice that would be uh, tumultuous. 
uh, and ruins and, and jeopardizes the solidarity of the community. She would be the last of the wives of the Prophet to pass away. She would die at the age of uh, 84 in another riwayah. She died at the age of 90, wallahu alam. After the death of the Prophet she lived a life of what we would call uh, seclusion. She wouldn't. She 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 retired uh, from public life. We would use this terminology. She just retired from being in public view. Um, all of her wealth she she donated to charity. Uh, she, charity meaning she gave it all to the fuqara. Um, and she lived during the time of the uh, the horrible tragedy of Karbala uh, and the, the the massacre and the slaughtering. And she heard about. The, the murder of Hussein. Um, and when she heard about that, uh, she became broken and saddened. And the rewires, the, narrates, the narrations report that after that she was a different woman. She actually became very ill uh, and she passed away not long after the death of Hussein. I believe it was Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala who prayed her janazah uh, uh, salat. So, in a nutshell, there's more to her life than we are allowed to mention in this short time. But in a nutshell, um, that is uh, who she was, wallahu alam. Um, there's a lot of lessons we get. One is her, her dedication to the deen of Islam, her notion of sacrifice, that even in the obstacles of violence uh, and, and, and oppression and injustice, she still, she still sought to migrate, she still sought to be in the company of Allah and His Messenger. Um, her dedication to the service of Islam after the death of her husband. Not only did she marry, but she dedicated her life to serving Islam, to serving the community. She's very involved in the affairs of the community. And her judgments were always balanced. Uh, and she spoke out. She was very outspoken uh, in matters that she thought uh, needed to be corrected when it came to Amr bil ma'ruf wa nahi an al-munkar, commanding what's right and forbidding what's wrong. She's very outspoken. Uh, uh, about that. And when the time came, uh, she retired from, from, from communal life. Um, there is this entire series, I mean, there's a lot we can learn from the biographies of all the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, and of course, from the biographies of the Sahaba as well. These few tidbits that we give are just, we want to encourage uh, all of you to pursue your own individual uh, study and reading in these matters so that we can not only be inspired by their character and by story and their stories, we can also uh, take lessons from their lives that relate to our challenges as a community and that we can be we can see how they overcame their challenges and how they were blessed tremendously for their sacrifices and investment in the deen, in the community in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yes ma'am The the inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Yes, yes. Aywa, aywa. Sahih, sahih. Yes. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Mhm. Right. Right. Right, Muhasan al-Akhlaq. Very good, very good, very good, very good. Yes, her akhlaq was that she was high level of, of, of akhlaq, and she was also uh, reports the dua that we all know, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Thank you very much for the reminder. Barakallahu feekum. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samiyal alim. Utuba alayna ya mawlana inna ka anta tawabur rahim. Rabbana hab lana min azwajina wa dhurri. يَأْتِنَا كُرَّةَ عَيْنٍ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا سُبْحَانَ رَبِّكَ رَبِّ الْعِزَّةِ عَمَّا يَصِفُونَ وَالسَّلَامٌ عَلَى الْمُرْسَلِينَ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ السلام عليكم